Okay, in the last module, we focused on monopolistic competition. And what we find is that for oligopolies and firms in monopolistic competition, they have to differentiate their products in some way because they have market power. And this is what gives them market power. And monopolistically competitive firms have to differentiate their products from their competitors even more so than oligopolies. Oligopolies have few competitors, and so sometimes there can be tacit collusion, but if there isn't, then to gain market share, they have to make their product different in some way in the minds of consumers, um, either in a real or perceived way, in order to sell more. But for a monopolistically competitive firm, since tacit collusion is pretty much impossible, the only way they can get, gain some market power and thereby increase their price and make more profit is to differentiate their product in some real way in the minds of consumers so the consumers will be willing to pay more for the product or in some perceived way. And so in this module, we will look at how these kinds of firms, oligopolies and even more so monopolistically competitive firms, differentiate their products in order to increase price, gain market power and market share, and increase their profits. So I'll begin by explaining why oligopolists and monopolistic competitors differentiate their products and discuss the economic significance of advertising and brand names, two very powerful ways in which these kinds of firms try to differentiate their products in the minds of consumers and gain consumer loyalty for purchasing their product. So first of all, let's define it. Okay, what is product differentiation? Well, as I said, product differentiation is the only way that monopolistically competitive firms can acquire some market power. Remember, under perfect competition, firms are selling an identical product, and so they can sell as much of that product as they want to at the market price, so they have no reason to advertise and differentiate their product because it isn't different, and they can sell as much as they want to at the market price. So it would be a waste of their resources to advertise. But a monopolistically competitive firm by making their product different because they face a downward sloping demand curve, they can gain market power, they can increase their price, and that's the only way that they can gain some market power to be able to do that. So product differentiation is very important for monopolistically competitive firms. So under that idea then, in monopolistic competition, firms engage in product differentiation because it allows the firm some degree of pricing power. In oligopolies, firms differentiate their products as a form of non-price competition to take market share from close rivals. So how is this done? Well, sometimes differentiation is real, meaning the product is really different in some way. A truck with four-wheel drive is different from a truck without. But sometimes the difference is not real. It's only perceived. The product is, might really be very similar or the same, but in the minds of consumers, it is perceived to be different in some way. And if it's perceived to be different some way, then that could be a real difference because people will be willing to pay for more for something that they perceive is different, even if it isn't really different. So uh, bleach is bleach. Whether you buy Procter & Gamble bleach or some other company's bleach, the chemical makeup of bleach is the same. So all those products are the same. But when those companies advertise and convince you that their bleach is better, if you believe it, and many consumers do, they will pay more for it. And companies will spend a lot of money trying to convince you that their product is different in some real way. So the point is, it doesn't matter whether the difference is real or perceived. If the consumer believes the product is better, then that firm can charge a higher price and reap higher profits. So how do firms in the same industry, such as the fast food industry, gas stations, or chocolate companies, differentiate their products? Is the difference mainly in the minds of consumers, or is the difference a real difference in the product themselves? Those are two different ways in which products can be differentiated to give these firms market power and pricing power. So there are three important forms of product differentiation, three different ways that firms mainly try to differentiate their product and make it different uh, from their competitors. One is what we call differentiation by style or type, 
The second is differentiation by location. And the third is differentiation by quality. So let's look at each one of these uh, individually and see how firms try to differentiate their product in these ways. The first way in which products are differentiated is differentiation by style or type. Think in the auto industry. You know, you can buy a minivan, you can buy a sedan, you can buy an SUV. They're all vehicles, but they all differ in, in many different ways. So we might think of pizza. Pizza is pizza, right? Well, not these days. No. Um, think of all the different companies that sell pizza and all the different types of pizzas that they make and all the different ingredients they put on their pizzas and the quality of those ingredients and how those ingredients differ. A pepperoni pizza with deep dish crust is different from the same pizza on a thin crust or with a crust stuffed with cheese. If a consumer really wants the crust stuffed with cheese, then he or she believes a regular pepperoni pizza with a regular crust is an imperfect substitute. This allows the seller to charge a higher price for the stuffed crust. As long as consumers have different tastes, producers will be able to increase profits by differentiating their products to suit those tastes. Consumers like variety, and consumers, each individual has different needs, wants, preferences, desires, and interests, and so this will lead people to be willing to pay more for something that better meets their desires or their needs or their wants. And this, so we, we say that you know, these products are differentiated in ways in which they become um, imperfect substitutes for each other, meaning that if a competitor is selling a similar product, you know, you're not going to pay $50 for a stuffed crust pizza, if that's what you really want, um, because you can find a thin crust pizza or some other kind of pizza for a cheaper price, even if you really want the stuffed crust. So they can only go so far in their pricing power because they're imperfect substitutes for each other. But consumers will pay more for that. The second type of differentiation is differentiation by location. Um, think of grocery stores and gas stations. Okay, People don't really want to travel far out of their way to get gasoline or to go grocery shopping. So the grocery store and gas station closest to your house are usually your preferred store and your preferred gas station. Why? Because of their location. Not because they're selling products that are better or different from a grocery store further away, or that the gas at one gas station is really different in any way from the gasoline at another station. It's just you prefer the closest location. And you may be willing to pay more for something for the convenience of being closer to you. So because of their location near your house, they are different and better than stores and gas stations that are further away and across town. And because shopping closer to home or getting gasoline closer to home saves you money and time, you are probably willing to pay a little bit more for the convenience of that location. You pay, may pay a little bit more um, in terms of the price per gallon for gasoline for a station closer to you than one further away. You may be willing to pay a little bit more for groceries in a store that's closer to you than to save a little bit of money to go to one further away. The third way in which products are differentiated is differentiation by quality. Okay, Think about, you know, ordinary chocolate like Hershey's versus gourmet chocolate that might be made in Belgium, okay? One is very cheap and inexpensive. The other is very expensive. And the quality of that chocolate is very, very different. The, the, the cheaper chocolate is of it poor quality in terms of the ingredients. The really expensive chocolate is made from real high-quality ingredients. And people, depending on their mood, their desires, their wants, may be willing to pay more for the higher quality of something. A Mercedes sedan and a Kia sedan will both get you to the prom or to the mall, but one is generally agreed to have a higher quality. Because most consumers agree that a Mercedes sedan is superior quality to a Kia sedan, prices are higher for the Mercedes. Even if quality differences are mainly perceived, consumers are often willing to pay a higher price for a product they perceive to be of higher quality. So there are two important features of industries with differentiated products. One is that there is competition among sellers. Producers are competing for the same market, whether it's a grocery store, fast food restaurants, gas stations. 
They're all competing for people to buy their gasoline, buy their groceries, buy fast food. So entry by more producers reduces the quantity each existing producer sells at any given price. If a new gas station enters the market, each of the other gas stations that already existed will sell less gasoline because some gasoline that they were selling will now be sold to the new gasoline. If a new grocery store opens, then the grocery stores that existed will lose some of their sales because they will then go to the new grocery store. Same thing with restaurants. So there's competition among sellers. And so when there's entry into the market that by new producers, it shifts the demand curve to the left for each individual firm that already existed because each of them will sell less. And that shifting of the demand curve And so what happens, because there is competition among sellers, is that when the demand curve shifts to the left for each individual firm, it reduces the price, thus reducing their profit. And that continues happening until they are earning a normal profit. And we saw that in the previous module. The second feature uh, of industries with differentiated products is that there is value in diversity. In other words, because we have more choices as consumers in terms of what we can purchase, we consider there to be value in that. Consumers gain from the increased diversity of products. If you walk into a fast food court and you have eight restaurants to choose from instead of six, there's value in that because you are probably more likely to have the choice of getting the food that you really want at that time, that you're in the mood for, that you are hungry for. If you have fewer choices of food, um, maybe you would unnecessarily have to pay more for the food that you buy to get something closer to what you want at that particular time. Um, or you're not going to pay too little uh, for something that you don't really want because it's not offered as an option. So we say that there is value in diversity. Um, because of these choices, and we talked about that a little bit in the previous module. So here's a tip for the AP exam. Product differentiation allows oligopolists and monopolistic competitors to decrease competition with their rivals. Therefore, it gives them some market power and ultimately pricing power to increase their prices and their profits and increase their sales. And that's why product differentiation is so important to them. If you go back to um, the Model Ford that was produced by, or the Model T rather, that was produced by Henry Ford in the 1920s, it, when he first started producing the Model T, he only produced one style of the car. It allowed him to achieve economies of scale and produce it at the lowest average total cost. But consumers didn't have any choice. They, If they wanted a car, they had to buy the Model T. There were no concessions to differences in tastes that people might have. But Alfred P. Sloan formed General Motors by combining several smaller companies that were offering different types of cars. And he challenged Ford's strategy by offering a range of different car types. The, the cheapest was a Chevrolet, mid-quality was a Buick, and the highest quality was a Cadillac. And they differed in colors, they differed in quality, and they differed so that it was differentiated by quality and price. And so some consumers that, you know, could buy a very inexpensive car if that's all they could afford or wanted. People that wanted something of higher quality and had more money could pay more for that. And so by the 1930s, the verdict was clear. Customers that are buying cars prefer to have lots of choices, lots of styles, lots of options, from inexpensive to very expensive to different qualities to different features to different body types to all different kinds of things. And so we find many, many different types of cars and vehicles on the market today in the auto industry. Now, there are some controversies about product differentiation. You know, the, the question is, is there really value in it? The formula for household chlorine bleach is NaClO. You know that from your chemistry class, sodium hypochlorite. This is the key bleaching ingredient in every single brand of bleach on the market that you can find at the grocery store. But the leading brand of bleach is Clorox. It has about 65% of the market share for household bleach, but it's no different than any other 
bleach that's sold in the market. So why do most people buy Clorox bleach instead of other bleach that is exactly the same? Because Clorox spends millions of dollars to convince people that their bleach is better, even that it, the, though there's no difference. And that's how they maintain their, their dominance. So economists wonder, are these advertising dollars just a waste of money and resources? And is this the best use of those economic resources? Um, well, that depends. You know, So the influence of advertising and creating brand names like this is important. And we, we explore, you know, do we get benefit from this or not? So let's look at the role of advertising. Okay, In industries with product differentiation, firms advertise in order to increase the demand for their products. Advertising is not a waste of resources if it gives consumers useful information about products. In other words, if you're buying a house and it describes that house as a charming one, two-bedroom house with three bathrooms and you know a, a finished basement and things like that, you're getting useful information about that product that you need to know whether you want to purchase it or not. So if it gives us useful information about the product, it's not really a waste of resources. It helps us make a decision. But if it's advertising that doesn't really give us any useful information about the product, it just tells us that the product is great and wonderful, but doesn't really give us useful information about the product to convince us to buy it, that's harder to explain. Okay, um, But consumers do pay attention to it. So either consumers are irrational or expensive advertising communicates that the firm's products are of high quality. So advertising delivers two general messages that often overlap. There, there are primarily informative messages, as I mentioned, you know, telling people the store is open for 24 hours, we sell trucks, cars, and motorcycles, we also deliver. That, th those are all useful pieces of information in advertising. So obviously, pure information is designed to persuade a person to make a purchase. But there are many advertising messages that, as I said, are completely absent of useful information. These are primarily persuasive messages. Our french fries are the yummiest. What useful information is that? The house is charming and located in a lovely neighborhood. Or this slogan, I'm loving it. Or just do it. Okay? What do those phrases mean? What useful information do they communicate? These advertisements will often use humor or celebrities, special effects, or musical jingles to persuade the customer that the product should be purchased over rival products. And if it is successful in differentiating the product, the price can be increased and people will pay more for it. So why do advertisements that are absent of real useful information work? Is it because consumers are irrational and just fall for this stuff? Well, maybe because consumers aren't as rational as economists think. After all, why is someone buying Clorox bleach and paying a price that is twice as high as the identical store brand bleach? Well, maybe it is somewhat rational. The consumer knows that a paid celebrity is expensive for a firm like Nike. The consumer says to himself, Nike wouldn't spend so much money on that celebrity if the product was junk, and the celebrity wouldn't be in the ad if the product were junk. So it might be useful information. Or if you go to the Yellow Pages and you're looking for something and you see a big ad, what you might assume is, well, if this company can afford to pay for this ad, it's probably a quality company and probably has a good product to defend. If a company can afford to hire a celebrity, maybe the celebrity doesn't use that product or purchase that product like they say they do, but if the company can afford that celebrity and that celebrity's reputation is on the line, then maybe that means that this is a quality product and the consumer can use that information to decide whether to buy it or not. So Clorox and Nike are excellent examples of how a firm has successfully, over many years, established such a strong brand name that consumers are willing to pay higher prices to buy those products. Firms also work hard and spend a lot of money to create a brand name in the minds of consumers, like Marriott, or Hilton, or McDonald's, or Advil, or Tylenol. Okay? They spend a lot of money convincing us that that name means a high-quality product and that we are willing to pay more for it. 
So a brand name is a name owned by a particular firm that distinguishes its products from those of other firms. Think about it. How many people say, oh, you know, when you want to blow your nose, I want a Kleenex. Well, Kleenex is an actual company, and they've trademarked that name. Any other company that sells that product, you can't call it a Kleenex. It's facial tissue. Or if you want to Xerox something. Xerox is a brand name of a company. You're making a photocopy of something. And other co copiers have to use that word photocopy. So brand names uh, distinguish products from those of other firms. And as with advertising, the social value of brand names can be ambiguous. Uh, brand names differentiate products in the minds of consumers. And some brand names have come to define an entire class of product, like the ones I just gave you as examples of Kleenex, which is really facial tissue, or Xerox, which is really a photocopier. Firms will spend lots and lots of money to establish such a strong brand name that the product is differentiated from all other close competitors. After all, why is that person spending way too much to buy Clorox bleach? Why is that person spending more money to buy Bayer Aspirin instead of the identical store brand? Why do you spend more to buy Heinz Ketchup instead of the Walmart brand Great Value Ketchup when they're really all the same? McDonald's is such an iconic brand that delivers an identical product around the world that if you're traveling in a town and you have a choice of restaurants and you, there's a local restaurant that it only exists in that town and you know, know nothing about that restaurant, the food may be great or it may be really bad. But if you go to McDonald's, you know the quality is the same around the world because McDonald's works hard to keep that quality the same. And so uh, American travelers have been known to seek out a McDonald's while in a foreign country because they know what they will get. With the local restaurant, you don't know what you'll get. If you go into a town and you want a hotel to stay in, you know what you'll get with a Hilton or a Holiday Inn. But if it's a local motel where there's only one location, you don't really know. And so people are willing to pay more for a brand name that they know because they know the quality they will get. So is spending money to establish a brand name socially useful? Well, maybe, because the brand name conveys information. It tells a traveler that if you choose a Holiday Inn in a new city, you know what you will get at a Holiday Inn because you're familiar with the brand. But on the other hand, like in the Clorox example, it may be persuading consumers to spend too much for a product that has only one differentiating characteristic, and that is the name on the label. So here's a tip for the AP exam. Advertising and brand name development are forms of non-price competition that competitors use to modify consumers' perceptions about their products in order to gain more sales, market power, and increase their prices and profits. Here's an activity we'll work on in class entitled Imperfect Competition in the News. And here's an article that we'll read called Hershey, Strong Product Differentiation and Good Key Ratios. And then we'll do an activity um, with respect to that article. So here is a summary of what we have looked at in this module on product differentiation and advertising. So this not only completes our work with module 68, product differentiation and advertising, this is the end of the last module in this unit on market structure. And so now we've concluded our look at the four different types of market structures in which firms compete. Product, uh, perfect competition, monopoly, oligopoly, and monopolistic competition.